The outreach workshop that I'm doing for you guys is relevant to the cube of truth. We are going to start right at the top. So the first part of this workshop is about veganism because we have to get clear about what veganism actually means before we start talking about how to do outreach. Veganism, if you ask a group of people what it means, you'll get multiple versions of what they believe it to be. You probably had this experience just by interacting with vegans. You'll find that the definition that they hold dear to them is quite different for everybody. Veganism has nothing to do with our health. It has nothing to do with the environment. It has nothing to do with human rights. It has nothing to do with our affection towards animals. It is only about justice for non-human animals as far as it pertains to humans inflicting harm, exploitation, suffering, et cetera, upon non-human animals. So this is about addressing non-human animal exploitation at the hands of humans. In essence, to summarize, vegan equals anti-animal abuse. Activism, what does it mean? In essence, what it means is speaking up for the victims in the same way that you would want to be spoken for if you were in their position. It is being a medium of truth and enacting change by prioritizing the victims and not the oppressors. I recently made a post on social media and the caption for that post summarizes in essence, what we do on the streets and why we focus on what we focus on. Animal agriculture doesn't start with corporations. It doesn't start with the government. It doesn't even start with farms. It starts with you. It starts with the consumer, the consumers who demand the products. And there's many different ways that you can create demand for animal exploitation. You may not necessarily purchase. It may be given to you. You may be wearing secondhand leather. Um, somebody might pay for your ticket to go to a zoo. There's many other circumstances I could point out, but you are creating demand and you're promoting that this culture of animal exploitation within humans is okay, it's acceptable. And that's what I mean by it starting with us, with humans. And what we do on the streets is we focus on the demand. We start from where it starts. And it's not to say that it isn't important to work in the political sphere to end things like government subsidies for animal agriculture. That is a worthy fight and I would like to see that succeed. I would also like to see more of the direct action stuff that holds the corporations accountable. But what we also really need is to start from where it starts which is the consumer demand. So that's why we do what we do. Always remember that you will never have 100% success rate in animal rights outreach. There is no magic set of words to use during outreach that will make someone go vegan. If they're ready, they'll listen. If they're not ready, they won't. This is a very important point for you guys to understand because you might get down on yourself if you don't get through to somebody and you may think that you've said everything correct and you may have said it all correctly but at the end of the day it comes down to the individual and whether they're willing and open to change and take action with the context provided your function as an activist is to hold the individual you're speaking with accountable for the animal abuse that they are responsible for and make them aware of the consequences of their choices your goal as an activist on the streets doing outreach at the cubes is not to plant seeds. Animal rights outreach is not verbal leafleting. What we mean by that is you're not just riffing off information and factoids to people. You're not literally a brochure in human form. You're not just telling people about how old chickens are when they die, how many chickens are killed, you know, etc. Um, the whole point is you're actually interacting with somebody and, you know, there are certain facts and information that need to be used at certain points throughout the interaction. But for the most part, most people prefer things to be kept simple. You might have heard the expression kiss, keep it simple, stupid. 
it really does apply to the majority of the public, especially when you're on the streets and people stop at a cube. You know, they're not usually looking for something that's too deep when they interact with you. Most people, in terms of digesting this information, will prefer for you to keep it simple and keep the statistics and the facts to a minimum. If the goal were to provide information, we would hand out leaflets and magazines and brochures. The function of outreach is to make people understand the consequences of their choices by holding them accountable and centering the interaction about what they can personally do about animal abuse on an individual level. Most people you speak with will try to deflect from accountability and palm this off to governments or corporations and say that they need to change. Or they might even start talking about other human beings and say, how are you going to get the whole world to become vegan though? These kinds of distractions that they bring up are all to deflect from accountability, individual accountability. So it's your job as an activist to bring it back to the individual. Veganism is not about love or compassion. You can dislike animals and you are still obligated to be vegan in the same way that it applies to humans. You can hate people, but you don't have the right to enslave, torture and murder them. Veganism is about justice. Your likability does not determine your rights. So outreach is not about how you or anyone else feels about animals necessarily. If you don't go around beating children, you aren't instantly a compassionate individual. If you don't go around abusing animals on the streets, you're not necessarily a compassionate person. Refraining from injustice does not make you compassionate by default. Veganism is a non-action. Therefore, it's not loving. It's merely the right thing to do, the sane and rational thing to do. This approach that I'm teaching you is about pure honesty. Telling someone the truth is the most respectful thing that you can do for them. When you agree with every statement said by the bystander, they will often lose respect for you and you will lose control of the conversation. When you do this, they see that your desire to be validated by them is stronger than your desire to end animal cruelty and the whole reason why you're standing out on the streets trying to engage with the public, thereby making a mockery of animal rights. Can you imagine if the primary goal of human rights activists was to be liked by the oppressors? In any other context, this would be insane. You may be hesitant to speak boldly. Whenever you are afraid to speak up for the animals directly or if bystanders call you too extreme, place yourself in the victim's position and analyze your approach from their perspective. Could you look a cow in the eyes and say, I'm doing my best on your behalf. I'm speaking for you as if I was in your position. Would you consider a respectful yet direct conversation too extreme if you were locked up in a slaughterhouse right now? Don't talk about health and environment. This is obviously a huge thing in the animal rights movement. Vegans so often talk about human health and the environment with an aim to hook people in to becoming vegan. And we tell ourselves, it doesn't matter how we get people to go vegan, just as long as they go vegan. The problem with this idea is that more often than not, it's a myth that these people actually go vegan. And if they do become plant-based, what they end up doing is becoming the worst kind of candidate for a vegan because they are the type of vegans to rub veganism through the mud on the basis of doing it for their health or for the environment, both of which are human centric. It's still a selfish message that you're promoting, which is completely beside the point and 
not the basis for veganism. The whole point of veganism is altruism, doing something for non-human animals. Non-human animals deserve to have a cause dedicated to them. And so when we promote animal rights, it should be about animal rights. Why do we think people care about either their health or the environment? Most people in the streets do not care about their health nor the environment. So rooting out outreach in these topics will marginalize the animals. Health and environment have become exacerbated because people do not take animal abuse seriously. Trying to hook people with an approach that revolves around what benefits them does a disservice to the animals. So focus on the root cause of the issue, the animal abuse. Whenever people talk about how badly our environment is affected by animal agriculture, whether it's someone who is vegan or non-vegan talking about these points, and by the way, most non-vegans already know about how bad animal agriculture is for the environment. Why do they know about this? There are so many victims involved in this injustice that it does in fact impact the environment. So the root cause of this issue is animal abuse. And so it makes no sense to talk about the symptom and to make this again, a selfish message for humans to benefit from. Why don't people care about ethics? Because vegans don't advocate for animals correctly. They focus on things like plant-based recipes, restaurants, weight loss, or deforestation. Another reason is they lead with phrases like friends, not food, or animal lovers don't eat animals. This is not a conversation about sympathy. This is a conversation about accountability. Don't plead with bystanders. Make them understand the consequences of their choices by placing them in the victim's position. Morality, when it comes to this injustice and injustice in general, you can say, but especially when it comes to this injustice is black and white. If bystanders tell you that you aren't considering the other side to this or that you aren't open-minded enough, that is a distraction. There is no other side to needless animal abuse. You either support it or you don't. Don't get lost in these distractions. Compare animal abuse to a comparable injustice and get it back on track. When you're comparing animal abuse to another injustice, we've found that the best thing to do is to compare it to them. Put the bystander in that cow's position. How would you feel if your babies were being stolen from you after you were raped and you had your neck sliced open? What I found is that most people mostly care about themselves. You know, they're not really going to understand unless they imagine for themselves what it would be like if they were in that position, if we want them to connect to what animals are going through. Which injustice should you compare to? I just touched on this a little bit, but we'll get further into it. It is most effective to compare the in to injustices such as child abuse or human trafficking, but even better, the most effective is to place the bystander in the victim's position. Avoid dog comparisons. This goes back to not leading with compassion. It's not about the love that people feel towards animals. It's about the hate that they feel towards injustice. I can't tell you how many times I've personally learned this lesson about using dogs as a comparison. And people will say, yeah, well, if I was in China, I would eat dogs. Here's the thing. Most people don't view dogs truly as individuals. One indication of that in our society is that we have dog shelters that kill dogs by the thousand. And so again, most people mostly only care about themselves. It doesn't come down to whether you can imagine your dog in a slaughterhouse. It comes down to whether you can imagine yourself in a slaughterhouse. Statistics keep them minimal. Outside of what is asked of you, state minimal information during outreach conversations. We are not on the streets to verbally leaflet. Let the footage provide the context to the conversation. You aren't at a cube of truth to be a statistician. You're there to have a concise conversation that holds people to account for their unjustified animal abuse. 
A conversation will go on for longer than necessary if it turns into an argument over statistics. And it's not to say that we can't win these debates. We can. We have logic and facts, reason. But what they're usually doing is they're trying to deflect from accountability. They're trying to distract the conversation so that they don't have to take action. So you have to understand that before you entertain any of those points. This is another reason why you shouldn't bring up health and environment talking points. And this is something I've learned time and time again, when I do bring up health and environment, if I entertain those points, and I know that sometimes it can be tempting, super tempting, um, you will end up debating how much iron you get as a vegan or whatever the case may be. All of it is just a distraction to what really needs to be discussed. Not everybody on the streets is worth talking to. Part of your role is to assess who is reachable and who is not. Many people are not reachable. This is a numbers game. I've had cubes where I've had zero people take the issue seriously over the course of three or four hours. It's part of the course. I've had cubes where almost every person I spoke to was open and willing and they got it. Plenty of those people that are open and worth talking to are out there. I also will say that even if somebody doesn't get it and you've said the correct thing on behalf of the animals, it is still worthwhile because you never know what kind of an effect what you've said will have on that person's subconscious. Um, and you never know how that may come up again within them in future. If they want to have a short conversation with you, keep it short with them. Don't entertain bystanders who want to engage in long argumentative debates. Do not underestimate the cunningness of non-vegan guilt and the ability that many non-vegans will have to waste your vital time at work for the animals. If people don't take this issue seriously, expect that they will want to waste your time. They may even seem sincere and nice. They may seem like very sweet people. But if they don't take this issue seriously, they may just take you for a ride and waste your time. When people feel guilty, and most people you speak with, by and large, will feel guilty, when their guilt flares up, they will have all of these mechanisms that come up to protect themselves or to defend themselves and to justify their guilt. And... That's what we mean by the cunningness of non-vegan guilt. You shouldn't underestimate it. You should understand that it's a very real thing and it will cause humans to behave in very irrational ways. I've never seen people act more irrationally than I have with non-vegans when we address this issue with them. So again, activism is not sales. Sales training does not equal good activism. Using slick talk to trick people into veganism does not work. Your job is to hold the bystander accountable. It's up to them which actions they take. Initially, AV made too strong of a connection between sales and activism. Tools taught in sales training only go so far. So this is why I'm making such a strong point about the sales stuff. It's because back in 2016, when we put together the model for the cube of truth and the outreach element to the cube, I did actually make too strong of a connection between sales and activism. So this was back in 2016 that I did this. And I essentially called what I was bringing to the table a value-based sales approach. And when I said a value-based sales approach, I was intending on differentiating from the general regular form of sales that people are commonly used to. Value-based, meaning there is no money involved here. However, what this did is it created this idea that if you have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of sales experience, that you're automatically experienced as an activist. And that's just not how this works at all. In fact, what I've found is, and I've personally done sales for well over 10 years, is a lot of what I learned 
is not actually applicable. Most of what I learned is not applicable in, in activism whatsoever. In fact, a lot of the little tools that we did bring over into activism, we no longer really use. It's just good to understand how certain aspects of sales work I just shared one thing with you guys, which is kiss, keep it simple, stupid. I'm not even sure if that belongs to the sales world, but that's where I learned it. And it applies to almost everything in life. And in essence, at its very basis, sales applies to life. You know, if you have children and they love to eat confectionery every day for every meal, convincing them to eat a carrot is sales. I'm convincing you right now to take this approach seriously and to follow this protocol while you're at Cubes of Truth. But my point is that it can get blown out of proportion. And like I said, it doesn't necessarily mean everything that you've learned in sales is applicable in activism. A successful conversation is not one where the bystander says, I'm going vegan. It's where you say the right things. This is really important. Again, like I was saying before, some people may not seem open and willing. They may not give you the answer that you're looking for. When people say I'm going vegan, that's obviously a good indication, but they may not be, they may just be excited in the moment. They may not be genuine about that. The best way to measure whether you've had a good interaction is to look at what you've said. Have you said the correct thing on behalf of the animals or not? If you have, you've done the best that you can possibly do. Most people become vegan after they hear the truth from us. How long it takes is up to the individual. The Socratic method, just by show of hands, how many of you don't know about the Socratic method? Okay, there's a few of you. So Socratic method, it's named after Socrates. And essentially what he taught was when you're in a debate with somebody, and this is more of a debate tactic, so that's why it's not applicable in its entirety to an outreach conversation because the whole thing isn't necessarily a debate. The whole thing is an interaction that will involve some parts of it being a debate. And so what he taught was instead of framing something as a statement in this context, for example, animal cruelty is wrong, right? That's a statement. The better way to frame it is as a question. What do you think about animal cruelty? Do you think that animal cruelty is wrong? Or how do you feel about animal cruelty? So one of those variations was a closed question and two of them was an open-ended question. We'll get into the open-ended questions in this slide. Socratic questioning is a communication tool that we use within our approach. It is not an approach in and of itself where we ask questions to lead the bystander to their own conclusions. Use open-ended questions such as, why are you against animal abuse? Instead of a closed statement such as, animal abuse is wrong. Open-ended questions are generally preferred to anchor and progress the conversation. You should use closed-ended questions and statements also but usually um, an open-ended question does a better job. Sometimes you just need to seal off and confirm an aspect of what it is that you're discussing at that particular moment. And that's where the closed-ended questions are important. Okay, this is important. You versus we. We don't torture and kill animals for products non-vegans do. Using we undermines individual accountability. This has been a personal lesson for me and something that we've all learned within AV for quite some time now. But essentially what we do as activists is we find ourselves saying we, we, we with non-vegans all the time. Why do we do this to animals? You know, we grow up. I know that we're trying to relate to non-vegans, but it does take away from individual accountability. And people do need to understand the clear difference between veganism and non-veganism. And they will not see and understand that difference clearly enough if you keep using language that isn't accurately describing the issue. If you keep saying we, you're not actually being accurate. So be careful about what it is you're saying. 
when you tell non-vegans that we as a society are responsible for animal cruelty in farms, it takes away the imperative for individual accountability. It makes them think of lobbying or government programs instead of personal responsibilities. People need to feel guilty to change. They'll only change once they understand that there is a difference between you, the vegan, and them, the non-vegan. I understand that that last slide might seem like we are creating division between us and individuals. It's not about being del deliberately combative and creating division with people. It's, again, just about making sure that they understand clearly that there is a massive difference between veganism and non-veganism. And I think you all already know this because otherwise you wouldn't be vegan and you wouldn't stay vegan and you understand that there is a big difference between what you're doing now and going back to being non-vegan a huge difference and that's why we should really be careful about the language we use okay why versus how people already know how to go vegan it's really simple stuff with the constant availability of google and the internet anybody can figure out how to become vegan instantly in order for people to feel the need to become vegan, they need to be held accountable for why they should do it. With any other injustice, you would never focus on how by talking about how to not participate in the violence. Focusing on the how in the context of any other injustice would be an insult to the victims and the entire movement fighting to end their oppression, pardon me. It's not to say that how is not an important talking point. We should give people that, but it's only at the very end once we have sufficiently and emphatically addressed the why factor. You know, we give people a card, as you know, at the end. We always arm people with the resources and the how factor. All you really need as a compass to be vegan is, is what I'm doing right now vegan or not? Does this restaurant have vegan meals? Is this product vegan? Is this ingredient vegan? Is going to zoos vegan? Okay, so it's really simple, really, really simple stuff. And I think that you should be aware of whether you're coddling people into this or not. And babying people into this is a problem. It shows weakness in the actual message if you're doing that. Vegetarianism is cancer to animal rights. I'm not just saying this for shock value. I truly mean this. The longer the vegetarianism and veganism get conflated, the longer it will take for us to get the message out there that veganism is about non-human animal rights and that that is a serious injustice that people need to take very, very seriously. Vegetarians are non-vegans and should be outreached in the same manner as anyone else. And in most cases, even harder, vegetarians are our target market. They're no different to paleo eaters, people who eat a paleo diet. Why should we treat them any differently? So as you may know, people who eat a paleo diet do not eat dairy. And we as vegans, I use this point a lot and I hear other vegans using this point a lot we talk about how the dairy industry is quite possibly the cruelest industry, at least for land animals on earth. Paleo eaters don't consume any dairy products. Why are they any different to vegetarians? Vegetarians don't consume flesh. While flesh is an obvious form of cruelty, we know as vegans that dairy is no different. And that what happens on dairy farms and in slaughterhouses to the cows and their babies is nothing short of an atrocity of a holocaust and is no different to what happens to animals in the meat industry. Arguably, it's worse in the dairy industry. And so, as you can imagine, it would be insane for us to call paleo people our allies, to put them in the same bracket as vegans. So why are we doing this with vegetarians? It makes absolutely no sense. It's counterproductive and 
it absolutely will marginalize the seriousness of this injustice the longer that we make vegetarians feel like they are animal people, like they are defenders of animals, like they are on the side of animal rights. They need to be held to account just like everybody else. Okay, so they are not allies. Don't let other vegans or non-vegans manipulate you into thinking that they are. So when you start the conversation, you could say, would you like to know why we're here? What's up, guys? Hey, how you doing, man? Oh, I'm doing really well. You want to hear what we're doing? Uh, sure. Cool. And with the context of the footage playing, tell them what the Cube of Truth sets out to do. What we are here doing is showing the reality of what happens to animals in the meat, dairy, and egg industries, and also other industries that exploit animals. Everything you see here is standard practice here and around the world. What we're showing on these screens is the standard practice for what happens in the meat industry in this country, but also around the world. These are the farms and the slaughterhouses that label themselves free range, grass fed, cage free, organic. Ask the following open ended question. What are your feelings on animal abuse? Then confirm their stance to form moral consistency with something like, so is it safe to say that you are against animal abuse? How does the footage make you feel? It makes me feel bad. It makes you feel bad. Yes. Are you both against animal abuse? Yeah. Yes. By the way, most people will say yes. It's very rare that you'll get anybody that says no to that question. Ask them, do you think it's possible to be against animal abuse while demanding products like meat, dairy and eggs? Do you think it's possible to be against animal abuse while eating meat, dairy or eggs? And this is where the truth starts to set in and most people say, mm, that's a really good question or their objections start to come out. Ask them what is stopping them from not abusing animals and becoming vegan. What do you feel like would be stopping you? And this is important that you say, what do you feel like would be stopping you? Not what is stopping you? Because there, as you know, nothing, there is nothing stopping anybody from going vegan, really, if you live in a modern society. What do you feel like would be stopping you from not abusing animals and being vegan? It's also important that you mention not abusing animals and being vegan and not just saying, what do you feel like would be stopping you from being vegan? What do you feel like for you two as individuals, what do you feel like is holding you back from not being responsible for any of this animal abuse and living vegan? It's much more powerful to add in the fact that you're not abusing animals when you're not vegan. This will lead to their objections. Objection handling. Whenever a bystander brings up an objection, place them in the victim's position and allow them to analyze the objection from that perspective. Every single time this happens, the objection will fall apart. You know, as long as they're being genuine, they're not being disingenuous intellectually, no matter what the objection is, it always crumbles. I'm still going to eat meat, but I'm going to try and do it as humane as I can. Imagine yourself in the animal's position. How do I murder you humanely? Is there a humane way for him to be murdered. I'm asking you now, just so you can help out maybe. There isn't, is there? Why do you say that? Um, because, as you said, they have the will to live and don't to get killed. Yeah, he's not consenting to being killed, is he? He's not saying, yes, I'm okay with being killed. You wouldn't say that, would you? No. Most objections are easy and quick to respond to. Some are more nuanced and require a deeper explanation but they should still be quick to respond to. Your response should always anchor back to individual accountability. It should always end up with the bystander you're speaking with being in the hot seat. If it doesn't end up with that bystander being in the hot seat, you aren't anchoring that point that you've just made correctly. It has to always end there. Bring it back to the individual. If they try to create excuses, they try to remove accountability, for example, pointing to rural communities, lions, low income families, etc. Don't get lost in lengthy explanations. Again, these things are distractions. Bring it back to the individual by placing themselves in the victim's position and asking how that excuse justifies their personal responsibility 
to animal abuse. I need to update these slides to be completely honest. Contribution and support aren't the correct words to use here. People aren't merely contributing to the animal holocaust. They're literally responsible for it. I'm going to give you an example. If a hunter's wife is at home and before the hunter goes out to have a day of hunting, the wife says, have a great day hunting, honey. She's supporting hunting, but she's not actually shooting the animals herself. Non-vegans aren't merely doing that. Non-vegans are quite literally responsible for the shooting, for the enslavement, for the torture and the murder. So contribution and support are not accurate words to be using here. Responsibility is the word to replace those words in all cases. Tie in the benefit. Tie in the benefit only once they concede by saying if they're against animal abuse, then it's not possible to be against animal abuse while being responsible for it. The number one benefit for being vegan, the benefit is that they no longer have to be tortured and abused because of you. In other words, you no longer have to be the reason that animals suffer in the worst unimaginable ways. For you as an individual, if you say that you're against animal abuse and what you see on the screens, then when you're vegan, you no longer have to be a hypocrite. Now, this is the part of the interaction where things get very real and where the person understands that you're not just having a wishy-washy, you're not just verbally leafleting, you're not just saying what vegans tend to say. You're having a real conversation about a real issue here and you're calling them out but you're not doing it because you are trying to be an asshole. You also should understand that telling somebody the truth is the most compassionate thing that you can do. It's the most kind and loving thing that you can do. Sometimes the truth can be harsh and can, and can sound brutal, but you have to understand that that's just the nature of truth. The truth is not always a bowl of cherries. And when you're a medium of truth, you have to accept that as part of your responsibility when you're spreading the truth. You have to be comfortable with the fact that sometimes it will sound brutal, but you're not saying it from a malicious place. Your intention is to end animal abuse and to change the actions of humans so that they are no longer responsible for it. In a way, it's liberating for the human as well as the animal who they are responsible for oppressing. So do you know what the number one benefit is for being vegan? Can you take a guess? Uh, like you're saving animals' lives. Yeah. What do you think it is? That as well? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it will help um, like the industry to not like, produce as much meat. Yeah. Because you're no longer demanding. Yeah. And they are supplying demand. That's basic economics. Yeah. You're one less person who's demanding it. Yeah. yeah. Let me put it to you this way also. The number one benefit for the animals is that they're no longer tormented, abused, and harmed in any way because of you. Yeah. You're no longer the reason that animals suffer immensely, are tormented and murdered. Yeah. The benefit for you as individuals also is that when you say you're against animal abuse, you'll no longer be hypocrites. Do you disagree with that? Does that, no. does that sound fair to you? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. This drives home the accountability and makes them understand the consequences of their choices. So this is where you close the conversation. Always end every outreach conversation by asking what the individual will be personally doing to take action. Ask the open-ended question after our conversation, what are you going to do about this injustice? After a long conversation, they may, they may still say that they'll only reduce or do nothing, or they may say something like, I'll try to do better. If you can sense that the interaction will keep going in circles, end the conversation with a statement. But with people who say, I'm going to try to do better, or I'll reduce how much meat I eat, they are still not getting how serious this is do you deem this to be an injustice? And usually they will say, yes, I do. 
And then I say, would you take the stance that you just took with any other injustice? You know, if we were talking about yourself as the victim in this injustice, would you find it acceptable for your oppressor to say that they are going to try to stop oppressing you? Or would you only deem it acceptable for them to stop immediately? So what do you think you'll do about this then? Um, eat less meat, yeah. yeah. Maybe even stop eventually. Stop. Okay. Now, is what you're seeing on the screens, is animal abuse an injustice to each of you? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. Would you take the position that you just took with any other injustice? Let's say you're the victims in this scenario. Yeah. Would you find it acceptable for your oppressor to try to harm you less and to do less harming of you? Or would you want them to stop entirely? Stop entirely. Stop. Immediately? Yeah. yeah. So please don't compromise when it comes to these non-human animals. Because they suffer just like you would if you were in their position. Again, they may not like the sound of that. Um, they, it may not be what they want to hear because essentially what they're doing when they say I'm going to try or reduce is they're pandering to you because they want to tell you what you want to hear. They can see that they're, in, they're on the wrong side of this. That's why they're saying these things to you to end the conversation. You, you become a mirror at that point for the ugliness that they represent. And when you say that their stance is not acceptable, Regardless of what they say after that, you've put the needle where it needs to be. An effective statement in this situation can be, and this is the last line that we always give people, um, we tend to leave them with this. So keep in mind that for however long that you're not vegan, animals will be abused and tortured because of you. So when you're ready to stop abusing animals and align your actions with your words, you know what to do. Think about what side of history you want to stand on. What I'd leave you guys with is just keep in mind that for however long you're not vegan, unfortunately, you guys are going to be responsible for what's taking place on the screen, this animal abuse. So just think about and decide what side of history you guys want to stand on when it comes to stamping out this injustice. And that's the workshop, guys.